Hey, <laughs> I'm Savannah. I'm Alicia. And this is Burden of Proof. We talked for a full hour, and so now it's afternoon. <laughs> we always have to warm up. Yeah, we have to we have to get all our giggles out and talk about our weeks. Yeah. So good times. Afternoon now. It also helps lessen that banter. <laughs> yeah. So I will say we- shout out to we've had I've had four people tell me after last week's episode. Well, it would have been like three weeks ago because we record so far in advance. Yeah. We were talking about during um Stone Fultz, I think. Maybe it was Tara Grant. I don't remember which one it was mm-hmm. about how people don't like some of the banter. And I've had four separate people DM us or tell me or text me or whatever and say, no, I like the banter. That's good. Keep going. So Yay. woohoo, we're here. And thank you, you to those fans who DM us and you tell are, us things. That's the best. You are our people. You are. Our tribe. So. All right. Uh, Can't wait to hear this one. Today, we're talking about... Darren Mack is his name. Darren Mack. Quite a name. And I don't, I still don't know if it's Nevada or Nevada. Nevada. So I'm going to say Nevada. Sorry, I'm still singing the, the, you're too young. You won't know. No, I won't. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just, uh, hearing Mack, I instantly started singing the Chris Carr song. Oh, I know that. Yeah. 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 I did that too. I'm going to say Nevada. Nevada. Because I think that's right. If it's wrong, I don't care. I don't. I do care. I don't know that it matters. I think it's one of those things like regionally. You always want to ask in somebody Nevada that really care. in there. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know anyone that lives there. Neither do I. Somebody tell me how to pronounce it. Nicely. Yes. Tell me nicely. <laughs> and I'll correct don't myself. Don't come for me. Don't come for me. But this is a this is a fun case. It has a lot. If you wanted a dramatic millionaire man baby, then you have clicked on the right episode. <laughs> Darren Mack's story has murder, snipers, the FBI, a manhunt, and lots and lots of sex and money. So, oh, here for the whole package today. Quite the mini series. Yeah, it's just one episode. It just sound, no, no, it just it reminds me of the little mini series movies. Yeah, that used to be so popular yeah. in the eighties and early nineties. Yeah. Has everything. <laughs> Any, everything and more. So Darren Mack was born on January 31st, 1961. He was born and raised in Reno, Nevada. And his family owned Palace Jewelry and Loan. And he started working there around seven, when he was like seven years old. As he got older, he started to help run the business. In 1986, he married a woman named Deborah Ashlock. And they had a son and a daughter together. And then they got divorced. It wasn't a fun or a cheap divorce. They started fighting and they never really stopped. It was not fun. According to one of Debbie's friends, she spent over a quarter of a million dollars in legal fees just responding to him. And all of their fights. Yeah. So. Jeez. Yeah. My parents were too poor to do that. one of those things remember we talked about that one of those things people were like that's not normal (laughs) no that's not that's yeah i know do we talk about that about trauma and people saying things (laughs) and you're just like that's okay (laughs) when you so to let the listeners know (laughs) oh was that not something we talked about in an episode i don't think so oh sorry I i think we just talked about that personally you know, but when you're to talk- let the listeners yeah. in on that little tidbit. So for any of our listeners who have suffered trauma, probably know exactly what yeah. we're talking about in that when you grow up experiencing like a, an extremely dysfunctional family or trauma, you don't know any different to you. That's just that's life. So yeah. then you don't realize until you get a little bit older. I would say it probably kind of starts to happen around middle school or high school age. That you're just talking and like you share stuff about your life and you say it like, no biggie, this is just my life. (laughs) And then you realize that people are either looking at you like you have two heads or they are like, are you okay? That's really sad. (laughs) That's what I'm referring to when I say that's not normal. It is normal for people to have that. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm I'm referring to that conversation where we were like, that's sad. sad. (laughs) Are you okay? 
I'm fine. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> My parents divorced a long time ago. Anyway, this is funny, but you had to be there. And yeah. you weren't there, so. But hopefully there, it's still I funny. Le- I let you in. Yeah. Now you're in the there. conversation. Anyway, he divorces Debbie. And then in that process, he meets a woman named Carla. Carla was a dreamer and a firecracker. After high school, she left Reno and moved to L.A. to pursue her dream of being famous. She didn't care how. Superstar. She just wanted to be famous. <laughs> I don't care how. Well, famous. I mean, it's happened. Yeah. The Kardashians. Yeah, them. well. They've done it. I love the Kardashians. I know you do. <laughs> I know I shouldn't, but I do. But, you know. I don't care. They I do enjoy a things. little bit of everything, but. I enjoy things. It's fine. Um, so she decided she was going to do this by being an actress, and she was in two films with some fairly big names, but ended up moving back to Nevada, and that's where she met Darren. They met, I believe, at like a wellness class. Um, Carla was either teaching it or attending it. Don't know for sure. But Darren was super into wellness and bettering himself at this point in his life, and he did all of this in order to help him achieve his dreams. And his dreams were... Cash money, honey. He wanted that green. <laughs> he wanted them Benjis. He wanted the bands. He liked money. Okay. Cool. So how, what was his dream in getting that big money? He didn't care. Oh, well, his family owned a, a massive pawn shop, like, empire oh, in Nevada. Gotcha. So, it, and this yeah. is what we're, we're going to talk about next. So money was not something that Darren really lacked. Um, not in the slightest. He was the oldest son of a wealthy and prominent Reno family. His parents owned one of the largest pawn shops in the city, and his father was killed in a plane crash in 1986. Darren became half owner of that family business at that point, and he was worth almost $10 million, according to court records. And we'll talk later about how much money he was actually making monthly. Wow. Yeah. That is surprising to me. I don't know why, but... Well, because it's it's not pawn shops aren't something you think of as making a lot of money. You yeah, go there when you need money, so you exactly. don't think of them as something that's profitable. But they do. Yeah, they do. Because they jip you when you take your stuff in. I am scared of that. So we're not talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he and Carla got married in 1995. And she sided with him in his divorce against Debbie. And then with her kids, they were a big happy family. And they were a really well-known and well-connected family in this Reno community. But that means that everybody knows everything. And they were very especially known in the area's strip clubs and swinger retreats. Oh. Ah, That's right, ladies and gents. They were swingers. Pretty popular ones at that. They went to retreats, swinger vacations to Mexico. They were very open and very. both of them were very sexual people. Go off, queens. That is... (laughs) Okay. <laughs> I'm just not... Pay- I have no idea what this guy looks like, but I'm oh, not picturing somebody very attractive. So. Oh, no. He's he's a good looking guy. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, I mean, not that it matters, I guess, but I'm still... He kind of looks like... Okay. Let me give you an image before I show you his picture. He kind of looks like uh, Elvis and David Schwimmer had a baby. <laughs> oh, my God. There's a picture. He's not unattractive, okay, for no. sure. No, but there is something a little... Here's here's another one. He also looks like another celebrity, but I don't know the other celebrity's name. Oh yeah, no, oh I do. It's Mark no. Cuban. Yeah, <laughs> he kind of looks like Mark Cuban. Yeah, especially um, in that picture. Yeah, but he's. I mean, he's. Uh, uh, I don't know why that picture comes up. He's uh, shirtless in that one. It's kind of weird. Uh, but anyway, he's eh in eh. my book. I mean, I think he's an attractive he's not, guy. No, yeah. Um, and there's Carla. Yeah, she kind of looks how I thought she would. Yeah. So, anyway. People knew they were swinging. They went to like a ton of events and stuff. So it was like common knowledge. Yeah. And they did that until their daughter Erica was born. Carla was a very, very invested mom. And eventually she told Darren, I don't want to swing anymore. It's just not who I am these days. Becoming a mom will do that to you. Yeah. Um, But unfortunately, this was kind of the beginning of the end for them. Darren didn't want to stop swinging, Mm -hmm. and she wouldn't bend, so they separated. I believe they were separated about a year before Carla filed for divorce, um, and Carla stayed in the home, and Darren rented a condo. There are talks of abuse on both sides. 
So it's something I think personally that we won't ever really know the definitive answers of. Yeah. Because, of course, Carla's friends say one thing. Darren's friends say another thing. Yeah. Um, But Darren did keep a diary with entries, including times where Carla allegedly kicked him, um, scratched his car, called him screaming at him. His friends say that they heard that call or not that specific call, but heard times where she would call and scream at him. Yeah. But Carla's friends say the same thing. They say they talk about a, a time where like he picked her up and was strangling her in the car. Like, so it it's something I don't think that we'll ever know. And there's a couple things in this case that are like that. Yeah. That only Darren and Carla know. And nobody else is ever going to know the truth. Those situations are really sad. Mm-hmm. I I think, honestly, there's probably a lot of abusive relationships like that. Because if you have ways. a fight in you at all, mm-hmm. and you're with somebody that's like nar- super narcissistic or abusive, you're going to have t- moments where you lash out yourself. Yeah. Um, not every abuse victim becomes mousy and mm-hmm. you know exactly. scared to react so and then it's a question of which came first the chicken or the egg yeah you don't know and does it matter in the and, end you know what yeah I'm saying? like it, your relationship is volatile and you need to separate yeah i don't really know what to say about the whole situation because i don't want to invalidate any abuse that darren was receiving if yeah. that's true But what I will say is that Darren makes several comments throughout this case that really, I think, attest to his character, and his character is yuck. Well, I mean, he is the subject of a true crime podcast, (laughs) so. so. But I think the real testament to that abuse, or any of the abuse that's discussed in this case, is that Carla is not here to talk about it. Yeah. So, Darren's friend, Michael Small, who comes in to play says that despite his imposing stature, according to this article, that Darren lived in fear of Carla. He was the one who said he was there a couple times when she called and screamed and threatened him. But Carla was also living with that fear as well. And Carla said to her friends at one point, like, he's going to kill me. He's going to come for me and he's going to kill me. So, again, everybody was saying it on both sides. And yeah. there's no definitive proof of anything. I mean, there might have been in divorce court, but I didn't read those documents, to be honest with you. There was just a lot. Yeah. I was going to say. Yeah. There's usually enough documents to read on the actual crimes. Yeah. <laughs> in the end, actually, it was Carla who filed for divorce and Darren moved out. The couple fought a lot, but especially over Erica and especially over money. Mm-hmm. Darren seemed to claim all of a sudden that he was running out of it. As they do Mm -hmm. when divorcing. So their divorce judge was the Honorable Chuck Weller. And so I think before we continue, it's important to talk about Judge Weller's reputation. And I'm just reporting this. I don't know. I don't. We don't live in Nevada. We don't. Or my attorney doesn't practice in Nevada. Yeah. I've never dealt personally with Chuck with with Judge Weller. But I'm just going to tell you what the people who do live there say. Okay. Don't come for me. (laughs) (laughs) His honor was not exactly well liked. There's a general consensus that if the judge was on that case, if if, if this judge was on your case, you tried to get him off as an attorney. And this isn't something that people just said. They actually kept a tally at the local bar association. Like, yeah. And he had twice as many challenges as other family court judges in the area. So... Did he, I mean, I've heard a lot of family court judges in different states. Yes. Being accused of being biased. So it wasn't that he was biased, although many men will say that he, they claimed it was women's court. Okay. That wasn't what the reporter who I read, who did a lot of research into why he was unliked. That's okay. not what she thought. What she gathered from her research, and I don't, I think her name was Marie I want to say gazelle, but that doesn't seem right because that's an animal. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I'll have it's linked in the show notes. Okay. Um, But she came to find that it was that he tended to just hear one side. It wasn't biased one way or the other man versus woman. Yeah. It was just that he decided and that was that. Yeah. Again, not making allegations. I don't know. So he was Bias, just not specifically yes. for women or exactly, for men. Exactly. Gotcha. But there wasn't, yeah, exactly. No solid reports on either 
direction of the bias. He would just hear the case and he would decide and he wouldn't He'd be really like, listen to the like other side. I don't like your story. Exactly. So, exactly. Yeah. But Darren and his friends did not think that that was the case. They thought it was women's court. And they really thought that Judge Weller was anti father's rights. There was a whole movement going on. There were many people who thought this. And there are a lot of courts that that's true, that the courts and the family courts favor women in a lot of places. There's whole states mm-hmm. that that, yeah. that Ohio was known for decades. I think it's just now starting to change. Mm-hmm. They were Ohio courts in general ruled in favor of mothers when it came to custody. Yeah. Like unless the mother had proven herself to be not worthy. Yeah. They- typically mom got full time custody, dad got visitation. Um, the only cases that that wasn't done mm-hmm. is if the parents agreed, like my husband's case, he's the only person that I knew that his parents divorced in the 80s when my parents divorced. Mm-hmm. He's the only person that I've ever known that they had joint custody. He yeah. split his time equally with each parent. That had everything to do with them deciding yeah, that exactly because everybody else that i knew whose parents were divorced in the 80s in ohio mom had full custody you visit dad on the weekends yeah so there are definitely places that do that but according to all reports i mean who knows so yeah. it was really darren's reaction to everything that this is at this point that kind of made me go icky with him because There's other things that may have swayed Judge Weller. Uh Uh-oh. Yep. Dean Tong was part of Darren Mack's divorce legal team, and he said that Darren was difficult to work with. He said, quote, he seems like a guy who would have trouble listening to others. He wanted to basically call the shots. Mm -hmm. He also said that he wanted, quote, he wanted to still continue doing what he was doing, which was sex swinging on the side. He explained to Darren that, like, hey, that's not going to look good. You're fighting a custody battle over a seven-year-old girl. The judge isn't going to want to know that you're going to the bunny ranch on the side, which is exactly what he was doing. Yeah. Um, but he basically was just like, oh, well, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with that if it comes up. So he kind of come up. He didn't take it seriously. And the divorce did not go in his favor. Not to mention that Carla wasn't working during most of their marriage. So it's not going to go well for you. Alimony, baby. Yep. And later at some point he says, well, I'm about to lose a lot of my money. And that always bothers me because you were married. And so if your wife isn't working, that is not just your money. Because she's she's taking care of your daughter or she's helping you run your business. She's not getting paid. It's whatever. It doesn't matter. That's my personal opinion. No, I have strong feelings (laughs) because I've been a stay at home wife, mom, the bulk of my marriage because my husband's job is very demanding. And so it's difficult for me to work a job and take care of my kids and the house and pets and all Mm -hmm. of it with him gone all the time. So, so anyway. thank God he doesn't think like that. Yeah. Um. So Judge Weller ordered Darren to pay Carla $10,000 a month over the next five years, as well as a lump sum of $480,000. That's a lot of money. Yes. So financially, Darren was pulling almost half a million dollars a year, which means he was making somewhere between, this is a big figure, it's a big jump, but somewhere between thirty seven and $50,000 a month, depending on... A bunch of different factors but he was making plenty of money yeah he claimed that the money was running out but i personally saw no proof of this i will say i didn't get as deep into the court documents as i normally do because of the way that this case was structured there was just a ton of them everywhere all at once so i will admit that this is i'm this is not the most i've ever read of a court case ever yeah i just didn't think it was that necessary you'll see in the end but through the research that I did do, which was still quite a bit, mm-hmm. I never saw a reason mentioned as to why he was running out of money or why he was broke. Well, what does he said it though? <laughs> I know. So it must be true. And and so my theory was that like basically his defense attorneys were like they were really expensive, very high profile defense attorneys. Yeah. At the end, when we get to the defense part, and they did say like he's going bankrupt. He has no money. 
But then when asked how they were being paid for, he said that he had a lot of good friends and family that cared a lot about him. So I'm thinking that there had to be a trust involved because that's the only way that the money wouldn't have been in his name. Mm -hmm. And then later when I was looking at appeal documents, I did see one appeal document that was his mom as trustee of the business trust. So if I had to guess, I am not an attorney. I'm rolling my eyes so hard right (laughs) now. If I had to guess, that would be my that would be my 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 educated guess. Anyway, but you know, you know, say all of this to say that Darren was pissed off about the amount of money he had to pay in his divorce settlement. But again, Carla hadn't been working. This is what he decrees. I think a major part of the problem was that Darren's friends were also going through custody battles and divorces in front of Judge Weller that were not going well. So there was a community of them just rallying amongst each other and making them angry. Hmm. One of his friends was ordered to take his son back to Florida and he blamed Judge Weller. But it wasn't his fault. His son's mom lived in Florida and the case was under Florida jurisdiction. Judge Weller didn't have a choice. But when he refused to take his son to Florida, when he did get to Florida, he was put in jail for 45 days or something like that. And he blamed Judge Weller, but it's not his jurisdiction. And like he wouldn't hear it. He wouldn't hear it. He was like, no, it's his fault. So it's stuff like that that I don't think is helping. Not to mention they're all part of this like father's rights movement, which fathers should have rights. I'm not saying otherwise. I'm saying that these people are a bit cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. I I can't say it. Uh, Never mind. It's no, I ha- I have strong feelings, but this is one of those moments that I will curb my opinions. <laughs> <laughs> they were definitely um saying that something should be done about specifically Judge Weller. Um Yeah, I mean yeah. if that many people feel that something is wrong, then something probably is wrong. But yeah, I just mean about the father's rights. Oh yeah. and, and and I agree. Father should absolutely have rights. Absolutely. That's part of the problem that was happening for decades yeah. of deadbeat dads not coming around. So if a father wants to be in his child's life, I am all for that. Absolutely. A hundred percent. Absolutely. However, I also have strong feelings about fathers who want to be in their child's lives, but only on their own terms. Yeah. I'll leave it at that. That's a nice way to say it. Yeah. And I don't know all of their friend situations. I don't. But I'm just saying that, like, I think this group mentality wasn't helping things. And also, Mm -hmm. these are, like, generationally rich men. (laughs) So, yeah. You know. You know what we're dealing with. So, I know what you're thinking. Savannah, are we still just talking about background? Not anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Moving on. Moving on. Just after 11 a.m. on June 12, 2006, the people of downtown Reno heard a large echoing bang off of some buildings. Detective Ron Chalmers, I think I'm saying that right, and a ton of police officers decided to shut down the city and they called in SWAT to start searching the skies, the building tops, the tops of trees for what they believed was a sniper. In fact, though, it was only one bullet. And it had exploded through the window of Judge Weller's office, spraying him and his judicial assistant with shrapnel. And Judge Weller was shot. He was rushed to the hospital and they began treatment on his injuries. And it was just a few minutes after that shooting when police got a phone call from a Dan Osborne. You see, Darren had a friend come to his house at this point when Charlie, her name is spelled like Charla. I'm sorry, it's Carla, but there's an H. And so I said, Charla because I'm reading it weird but it's Carla I actually knew somebody in middle school who was named Carla and spelled like that Hmm. so sorry if I said it wrong but yeah I could see how you sorry make that mistake was reading my notes and I read it wrong where her name is Carla so Darren's friend Dan was at the house when Carla came to drop off Erica he brought his dog over and so they're just they're chilling they're hanging out and Darren kind of pulled Carla into the garage or like away to have a private chat. And so Dan took Erica upstairs. Because he was like, mm, this isn't going to go well. So we're going to take them upstairs. I think Erica was around seven at the time. And they, like I said, were upstairs. And Erica told Dan that she heard his dog barking downstairs. Because it's a condo. Yeah. And after a few minutes of the erratic barking, he decided he was going to go downstairs to check on his dog. As a dog parent, I understand. You're like, oh, my gosh, you're causing trouble. What are you barking at? Yeah. Yeah. 
He was downstairs when he passed Darren, who was holding his hand wrapped in a towel. But Darren didn't say anything. He just kept walking. A few minutes later, his dog came around the corner and was covered in blood. So Dan was like, "Uh uh-oh. And he basically went upstairs, told Erica, we have to leave. And he took Erica and he drove away. Good. He was only a few minutes into his drive when Darren called him and said to meet him at Starbucks. So Dan was an employee of the family business. And maybe he felt like he owes something to Darren because he does take Erica to meet him at the Starbucks. Now, I don't think that he had any intention of ever letting Darren hurt or take Erica away, but he did let him talk to her. But especially if you're not even family and you have somebody else's child, like you don't want to be accused of kidnapping. Yeah. And you don't know what happened. You just like think something was wrong. So you reacted well. I mean, I personally don't think I would have stopped at Starbucks. I would have just like found Carla or something. Yeah, I just would have left far enough away, stopped, called Called 911. Yeah. Yeah. But I... Listen, you're friends with him. I get it. I Again, I don't think he had a, ever yeah. had the intention because everybody in the case really did love Erica and they were all doing what they could to do right by her. Yeah. Um. So anyway, Darren talked to her for about five minutes before he left again and left Dan with Erica. Okay. okay. That's kind of when he called the police and told them, this is a little sus. Yeah. Also, I'm very distracted because I just keep thinking... Did he take his dog, too? <laughs> or did he leave his dog? I think he left his dog. I would have been scared. I would have taken my dog. I would have been like, you maniac. You got blood all over my dog. Anyway. I don't I don't know. I don't, I'm... <laughs> it's okay. I want to know if I can find what happened to the dog. It's okay. <laughs> no, I want to know now. Okay, I'll look later. Honestly, it's probably not in any of the sources. <laughs> probably not. Well, and I'm pretty sure it was Dan's dog because Erica said, and this is the weird, the weird version of reading it through like four different way, accounts. Yeah. But Erica said, it's your dog is barking. She didn't say dad's dog is barking yeah. or our dog is barking. She said your dog. So I assumed it was Dan's dog. Yeah. Anyway, he called the police, reported everything. And just a few minutes after the shots were fired is when this phone call slotted in. Police arrived a little while later with detectives to find three drops of blood outside of the garage before they opened the door to find Carla's body, and she had been stabbed seven times. They begin searching the condo where they find two important pieces of evidence. There's a list that the media ends up calling Darren's to-do list, which included, quote, end the problem and a list of weapons and supplies. And then also inside the house, they found a rental contract for a silver Ford Explorer SUV. The list also had the words, parking garage if yes. They find all of this stuff, but they don't find Darren. So they put Erica into hiding. Carla's new boyfriend has to lay low and a huge manhunt begins. Police review the surveillance footage of the garage across from Judge Weller's office. Mm -hmm. And around 1041 a.m., just 20 minutes before the shot was fired, a silver Ford Explorer enters the parking garage. And then 48 hours recapped the footage and kind of traced the path that they think he took that day. Basically, they think he drove up to the fifth floor, backed into a parking spot directly across the street from the Justice Center. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the shot was fired around 11.05. And then the rear hatch is caught on cameras being closed at 11.05. So it was like he opened the, the hatch, shot the gun, shot the hatch. Yeah. And then the vehicle left the parking garage. Some people were like, it would take a skilled, like, marksman or somebody to make that shot. But Darren has an extensive history in hunting. So yeah. people weren't really shocked that he could he do did it. it. Yeah. Yeah. So within a few hours, the news started saying that Darren Mack was not only the suspect in the Judge Weller shooting, but also for killing his estranged wife, Carla. His cousin went on television and made a uh, quite an interesting statement. Um, and he says, quote, If Darren is listening, if he's watching, we love him and we care about him. If he's responsible for this, he snapped. He broke. The press needs to ask what went wrong in that courtroom. That would make a good, loving, caring person like this possibly snap. And this made me annoyed because, like, the judge didn't pull the trigger, right? Like, Darren did. The judge made tons of judgments that people didn't like, 
it was a known problem, but none of them shot him or stabbed their wives. So, like, it's very clear that Darren isn't acting as a reasonable person, and so let's not victim blame here because, yes, Judge Weller was known for not making the most clean judgments, but it's still not his fault that he was shot. And, oh, so many things. Yeah. Okay. So, not only that, but how how do you explain that, okay, he, if he had shot the judge and only the judge... Because he was angry at the judge's decision. Mm -hmm. I might listen to that comment and go, well, mm, okay. Still agree with you. You shouldn't victim blame. Yeah. But you mean to tell me that a judge's decision is 100% the cause of this man killing his wife who he loved and had a child with and it's the mother of his child that he so desperately wants to to keep this wasn't about the kid this wasn't about like i'm sorry he may have snapped agreed but one bad decision on the part of the court mm -hmm. does not turn a person so much that they're going to kill somebody that they once loved yeah well that's yeah. insane to think that that no i don't no. Bro. Just no. Yo no say because. Just no. Yeah. I was my really frustrated was, by that My comment. dude was not very loving mm -mm. <laughs> towards his wife, I'm sure, long before she left him. I'm guessing. I agree. Just, to, just, That's just throwing that out there. Well, four days into the search and four days after Carla's murder, there was still no sign of Darren. He was busy living it up at a resort in Cabo. He and Carla had been there for a swingers event a few years prior, so he was there Jay chilling, just vibing. He was flirting with workers. He hung out at the gym and was even spotted by a pilot. Now, at this point, Darren is on the FBI's most wanted list. Yes. His face is plastered everywhere because he shot a judge. Yes. So not only did he kill his wife, but we all know in the justice system that if you kill somebody involved in the justice system, mm -hmm. it's a little bit more, a big deal. So they were coming for him. And this pilot saw Darren aggressively flirting <laughs> with a worker at the resort. Ugh. And he knew that Mac was a wanted man. And so he flew back to the States. And when he did, he said, hey, by the way, I saw this dude. He's at a resort in Cabo. Well, by the time the FBI got there, he had already moved on to another beach. And then another beach. And he stayed a step ahead of them for another few days. It was a week after that when he finally offered to surrender after speaking to DA um, Dick Gamick. <laughs> Your face as you said that. Sorry. <laughs> How do you get Dick from Richard? You ask him nicely. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> basically he had called uh the da and said he was the only person in the justice system that he trusted and um he helped him retain two high profile defense attorneys and then he called to say i'll surrender it's fine yep i don't uh, okay they kind of think that the reason he decided to surrender was because he wanted to shed some light on what he thought were judge wellers and justices he was trying to make himself a martyr in the father's rights movement. He sent a series of weird and clearly desperate emails while he was on the run, and they were all painting him out to be a martyr. One said, remember, they want me as a sacrificial lamb. They want the pleasure of executing me. He also says later, his quote, his story must get attention. I'm sorry, that wasn't the quote. <laughs> his story must get attention, quote, to save the hundreds of thousands yet to go through little Nazi Germany in the divorce industry. So that's the kind of person that Darren is. And it just, I'm viscerally angry right now because it's, ne your divorce is not equivalent to genocide. And it's never okay to say stuff like that. I will tear your tongue out. Stop talking. That's not even the worst thing that he says. Like, I, well, it might be the worst thing, but the, it, but no, because he says things that are just equally as bad. They're just so tone deaf. And I have just no gross. words. It's like, just I just want to crawl out of my skin right now. That's 
I told you. Yuck. Why are you... Really? Really? Nazi Germany Uh, is the same as your divorce? No. I, I... No, it's not. No. 11 days after Carla's death, he surrenders in in Mexico. He was arrested with $36,000 in cash and a suitcase full of bloody clothes and shoes that did match Carla's DNA. Why would you keep them? I don't know. He also had her shoes. Like when they found her, her shoes and socks were gone. I, I, weird. Like fully clothed body, no shoes and socks in the garage. Wacky. So, yeah. That's that's the story. So anyway, that's not the end. We still have the trial, but I'm yeah. saying that's he surrenders and I'm angry. So I'm flustered yeah. and talking weird. Anyway, let's get it's into the okay. shit show. <laughs> this is a shit show. This is not fun. Like I said, he had two high profile defense attorneys, one of which re- represented Britney Spears and Martha Stewart. So he's got the big guns. Mm. I mean, Martha Stewart still went to jail. but <laughs> So <laughs> all right. Um. Anyway. The DA's office excused themselves from the case. Like, the prosecuting office mm-hmm. was like, we're too close to them. And also, he wanted to be a witness because he did call him. So, he kind of needs to be. But okay. um, later, because of their relationship, the entire trial was moved to Las Vegas. And that original county was barred from having any civil cases against Darren come up. So, they had to move it to a different county in order to do that. He pled not guilty at his arraignment. And his defense attorneys tried to get him a competency evaluation. The prosecution decided not to seek the death penalty. And then one of his defense attorneys even tried to get the attempted murder charge from Judge Weller dropped. Because he lived. So it was attempted murder, not murder. Mm. Whoa. Go, Judge Weller. We'll talk about where he is now later. Okay. Basically, his defense team tried the insanity defense despite telling Darren, like, this isn't going to work. Because there's a list proving premeditation. Yeah. And so it's planned. So it's just, there's a lot of reasons why this is never going to work. No. Darren also tried to say that it was self-defense and bringing in more of the abuse angle from Carla's side. Her friends say, like, that's crazy because even with all the allegations, she would never have attacked Darren. And if she did, she definitely wouldn't have done it when Erica was there. Yeah. So I think at the end of the day, only Darren knows what happened in that garage. So. Yeah. He stabbed her. Yeah. Seven times. And then stole her shoes. <laughs> Which is the <laughs> weirdest part. And then he did it with the dog in there. I don't. I don't know. We'll never know ever what happened. That poor dog. I know. That's terrible. I'm it's sorry. Horrendous. <laughs> it's. I'm sorry, Carla. Sorry, Carla. But um, yeah. Yeah. I'm really sad for the dog. Anyway. Then in 2007, in November, Darren pled guilty via Alford plea for a plea deal. So an Alford plea or an Alford plea, yeah. however you want to pronounce it, is basically when someone's like, um, actually, I'm innocent, but I'm going to admit that the evidence does really make it look like I did it. Yeah. <laughs> and so if we went to trial, I'd probably lose. So I'm going to get a plea deal out of it, but I'm innocent and I don't want to say I'm guilty. Yeah. It's, these are always weird to me and it's very case by case. If you want to see a different example um, and you don't want to listen to me talk about it anymore, I recommend watching The Staircase on Netflix. Mm -hmm. Fascinating show. Oh, my gosh. I still don't know if he did it. But he also pleads guilty through an Olford plea, not to spoil it. But, you know. (laughs) Um, And so every case that I see an Olford plea used... One of I my cases that I did mm-hmm. had that, and I don't remember which one now. I don't either, but I remember just talking about it, but <laughs> yeah. I was like, I don't remember which one. So anyway, I feel differently about it every time it's used. But in this case, I think it's obvious that Darren killed Carla and tried to kill Judge Weller. So I'm not really sure that the Alford plea did anything for him, especially considering that the judge on the case was not required to follow his plea agreement sentencing request. Mm-hmm. He could just do what he wanted. It was just like, we'll lower what we're asking for. Yeah, but the judge can still sentence how he pleases, so. I want to reiterate. Hey, good luck with that, because you shot a judge. Exactly. He <laughs> tried to kill a judge and then told the judge, well, like, I didn't do it, but, like, it looks like I did it, so go easy on me, please. And it didn't work. <laughs> so, 
So he got life for Carla's murder, and he got 40 years with the possibility of parole after 16 years for the attempted murder of Judge Weller. Okay. Oh. So you know what comes next. Appeals. Lots of appeals. He basically started saying that he only pled guilty via Alfred plea under duress and that his signature was forged and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Nothing. Ever, ever the victim. For sure. For sure. This is this. This is the next quote that I'm going to talk about is actually what made me want to cover this case because it just made me so mad that my blood started boiling and I felt like a piranha gonna just I'm just gonna attack oh. something. I already feel icky. Yeah. He said that. <laughs> I don't want to say it out loud. <laughs> you have to now. <laughs> Can we cut this out? Anyway, he said that he compared the experience of being forced to take the Alford plea as being psychologically raped and that he, quote, I have a whole new compassion for women who are raped now. Oh, my God. Mm. so mad i think i'm just gonna let that stand on its own i don't think it needs commentary yeah no i i can't no so how do you none of his appeals absolutely went anywhere no one said that because when he gave the alford plea he had to read a statement saying that he did it of his own free will and he read it and he understood it and the judge said he understood it and so it never went anywhere yeah so on March 18th, 2008, uh, Washu, that's how it's said, that's how it's spelled, Washu, Washu, county jury <laughs> delivered a $590 million settlement against Mac in the wrongful death lawsuit of his wife, Carla. $560 million was awarded to Erica, and the remainder went to Carla's estate. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine being worth $960 million at like nine? All because daddy killed mommy? Whether she'll ever see that money, I don't know. Yeah. Well, remember, he's going bankrupt. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, <laughs> when I was looking through the appeals is when I found that um, one of them, his mom was listed as trustee of the Palace Jewelry and Loan Company Incorporated 401k Profit Sharing Plan and Trust. Oh. That's a really long name yeah erica's two grandmothers ended up going through kind of a rough custody battle but i'm pretty sure that they ended up splitting custody of her and then two more things and then we can be done with this yucky case judge weller on a positive front has turned into a huge domestic violence advocate because that's what this case is it's domestic violence Mm -hmm. when we talk about spousal killings i always think it's important to remember that these are often a result of domestic violence And it's scary. But Judge Weller went on to receive a master's degree in judicial studies, writing specifically about domestic violence, and a doctorate in judicial studies writing about court security. He says, quote, I wanted to understand it. I wanted to understand what happened and put it into context. That's the reason I started to study more about domestic violence, because in my mind, this was clearly an act of domestic violence. And I wanted to learn about court security, and I find what happened to me was typical of court security incidents. He teaches court security at National Judicial College in an attempt to keep other judges and themselves safe. Also, shout out to that judicial assistant who got shot at. That's crazy. Yeah. That was um, an interview that he did for an article that was written 10 years after the case for the 10-year anniversary of the case. Go judge. Yep. And then the other thing I was going to say before we close out is that there is an American Monsters episode on this case that people talk about a lot, but I read in a lot of the reviews that um, it was very victim-blaming of them for Carla's sake. They kept saying that it was Carla's actions that resulted in that, Um, so I didn't actually watch the episode. I saw too many people saying that, and I was like, I don't even want to see that perspective, so that is not in my source material, and that is why. I personally feel really unsatisfied by this whole case. I know that he went to jail and I know that he was forced to pay them a lot of money, but he's such a douche that, like, it's hard to feel satisfied with that. Yeah, I'm still hung up on how anybody could 
I don't care how much of a bitch she was or if she did fight back and they were both guilty yeah. of a volatile, like I said, a volatile relationship, you should be done. Of course, when you have a kid, you're not done, at exactly. least until that kid is grown. But that she's the one that got stabbed. Yeah, it's like that's just ridiculous. Yeah. To ex- try to excuse his actions away by, oh, well, she did. I don't care what she did. Yeah. And his whole, like, pleading not guilty via Alfred plea is really, like, it made me so angry. And then trying to say that he didn't do it. It's like, just at some point, you have to admit that you did the crime because you literally, you literally killed her it. with your friend and daughter in the house, dude. You rented a car beforehand. You knew what you were doing. It was clearly premeditated and you only pled the Alfred plea because you knew you were guilty. And that's not what it's for. And that's annoying. Just stupid. All of it. So stupid. Yeah. Ick. Ick is right. Well, I feel icky now. I do too. But I can go take my aggression out on my floor that I'm remodeling. (laughs) Yeah. And not my husband. Yeah, because there's never an excuse. No matter how mad I am, I'm not going to stab him seven times. You'd have to be able to reach him, stab him. <laughs> Her husband's very tall. I could reach something. <laughs> could get him in the side, in the, kidneys. in the back, in the kidneys. Anyway. <laughs> I don't know. I'm very unsatisfied with this case. I finished yeah, it, and I was like, icky. there's just no way to tell this case in a way that's satisfying. Because I was trying... I mean, we tell the cases as they happen, but also it's important. You're still listening to us tell the story. You want it to be something that's good to listen to. Yeah. But there just wasn't a good way for this. I will say, if you want to read an article about it, CBS did an excellent article that was really great. It's linked in the show notes. Okay. But anyway. I personally don't know that I want to hear more about this guy. Oh, probably not for sure. I hope that. Um, somebody has made him really relate to and be sympathetic to how women feel when they're raped. Oh my god! <laughs> Sorry, I Too hope much? you're having fun in prison. Too much. <laughs> That's a lot, but I, you know, you're not Too incorrect. Much? Sorry. Oh, okay. I don't know. Listen, no, I we're not. We all we're know. Done. We're done. We all know what happens <laughs> in prisons, and. I'm just saying, mm. you do the crime. He also killed a judge. He tried to kill a judge, though, so people might, I don't know. They might be like, they might go, be like f- go, go for you. you. I don't know how prison works. I don't know. If you made it to the end and you're listening I to think- all of this talk, <laughs> please go comment little handcuff emojis on the Instagram post about this yes. case. Um, and you get a gold star. <laughs> Absolutely. So, yeah, it's a rough one. I want to go. I'm going to go eat some Chick-fil-A or something. I feel gross. So, yeah. All right. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Till next time. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening, guys. Find us on Instagram and TikTok at Burden of Proof Pod and email us at burdenofproofpod at gmail.com.